All right, welcome to the last part of One Man's Faith for today. We are looking at respecting the anointing, respecting those that God has anointed. Okay, we're, and we've been looking at, at Moses and the children of Israel and what they have done. I've got so much more here we could look at. There are other, there are other ways. Uh, Korah came against Moses and said, we're better, or came against Aaron, I think, and said, we're better. We can do this. We can bring. And they ended up dying. Okay, right after that, um, in chapter, let's see, that was, uh, I think that was chapter six, in chapter 16, but in, uh, I'm trying to find, okay, I steal the core thing. Oh, um, and they died, okay, Korah, Korah and his family died. I wish I could go into that some more because there's a lot of good stuff. There's a lot of good stuff there. Uh, oh, right after that happened, the next day, right after this Korah thing happened, Korah and 250 of the leaders of Israel, man, if you've got 250 leaders, you've got to be right, right? And he's got to be wrong. It doesn't work that way. It's not a, it's not a democracy in the kingdom. It's a theocracy. God's in charge. And God puts people in charge. Listen, right after the earth swallowed up those, there were three families that were, that instigated this whole thing. And they got 250 of the leaders to come against Moses also, which, you know, the rest of the congregation said, well, these leaders, these pastors, these doctors, these bishops, whatever, They've got to be right, and this guy's got to be wrong. No! But the earth swallowed them up, and then the 250 leaders were burned with fire. God sent fire down on them. The next day, it says, on the next day the congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, saying, it's because of you these guys died. Oh. Well, let me tell you. They came against God's anointed. It led to 14,000 of the Israelites dying because of that. What a shame. What a shame. But something had to, be happen something had to happen because you can't come against God's anointed. David is another is another example. Uh, there are several places in David's life. One, when Saul came into the cave to relieve himself, they were in there, and his men said, hey, here's your chance. Do away with him. You can become king. He said, I can't. He's God's anointed. He's God's anointed. Uh, and David always held respect for him, even though he, he hated David. He was going after David. He was still God's anointed. But didn't God make David king? Didn't he anoint him king? Yeah. But Saul was still the king. Saul was still the God's anointed. And when Saul died in battle, an Amalekite came to David and said, he's dead. David said, how do you know? He says, because he was dying and he asked me to finish him off. And he said, here, here's his bracelet and his crown. And you know, David could have said, all right, I'm king. I got the crown, put it on and claim himself. And he did not do that. As a matter of fact, he looked at Amalekite and say, what are you doing? Raising a hand against God's anointed. David always respected him even though he knew God had anointed him to be king. The king was the king until the king wasn't the king anymore. And so David um, watched out for him. Oh, Neil, that's all good, and that, but that's all Old Testament. Well, let's go, okay, let's look, because we're going to do it quickly. Let's look at the New Testament, okay? 
In Matthew 10, we have this, and I, and I say this over and over again, the 12 were sent out by Jesus. He said, go, do not go the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts or, or a bag for your journey or gold or silver for your money belts uh, or even two coats or sandals or a staff for the worker is worthy of his support. And where, in whatever city or village you enter, inquire who is worthy in it and stay in that house until you leave. Verse 12, as you enter the house, give it your greeting. If the house is worthy, give it your blessing of peace. But if it's not worthy, take it back. God is sending them out. And, and listen, this is what he tells us. He says, don't take money with you. Don't take two tunics. Now, in another instance in Luke 7, Luke 10, when he sends out the 70, he doesn't give all this instruction about, about doing that. He does send them out by twos. Okay. But they were to go and wherever they went, they were to ask who is worthy here. Who is, who is the most anointed in this town? That's who we want to stay with. And if there's no peace there, then you take your peace back. Okay? He says in uh, uh, verse 40, he said, who, He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. In other words, he who receives you receives me, Jesus, and he who receives me receives God. Okay? He who receives the prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. There is a reward for honor and for receiving God's anointed people. I don't care if they're a pastor or whether they are filling the office of prophet or apostle or evangelist or teacher. It doesn't matter. These are the Ephesians 4 says, and God gave these anointed ones. It doesn't matter if he's a pastor in your denomination or not. If he's been called a pastor, if he's taken the position of pastor, if he's, if he's doing what he was called to do, then he is God's anointed no matter whether he's a part of your denomination or any other denomination, we've got to be careful not to talk against God's anointed. It is dangerous. We need to learn to respect it. Listen, honor and respect are positional. They are not relational. It has nothing to do with who they are. It has to do with the ministry they have. Look at Saul. Good example. Look at Saul. What is an honor's reward? What is the reward of a prophet? Or what is the prophet's reward? Well, there's, we have several examples. We have a lady who, who cared for a prophet and he finally said, well, what can I do for you? And she said, you don't have to do anything, Lord. But the prophet's servant said, she's barren and she'd like to have a child. And so he prophesied over her and the reward was she had a child. That child later dies of a heat stroke. She calls the prophet. He comes and lays out, sprawls out on him. It, that's not normally the way we, things like this are done, but this is what the prophet did. And he came back to life. So, so the, the prophet's reward for, for, for showing respect to that prophet was to have a child and to have it be raised from the dead. There was another lady who the prophet came to her and said, hey, I know you're going to make that last cake for you and your child and then you're going to die, but make me one first. And because she did, she had enough flour and oil to last till the drought was out. You see, there are rewards for respecting and honoring people. In that case, the prophet. In Acts 5, we have Ananias and Sapphira. 
things have been happening. People have been coming to the Lord. It, it, it got to be where, where, where people were taking their own possessions, their own lands or whatever, selling it and bringing the money to the apostles to be used. Listen, you know there's really a move of God when people will take their land and their, and their possessions and sell them and give it. All right? And an ice and fire saw this. They sold the piece of property, but they didn't want to give it all. And they didn't. But they said they did. The Holy Spirit spoke, and Peter said, why, why are you lying against the Holy Spirit? You see, they're not respecting the Holy Spirit, i.e., the anointing. Remember, we've talked about that in the past weeks. And they both died because of that. In, in Acts 13, here's another one. This is Paul, and uh, he goes to the synagogue in, uh, in, in Cyprus, <coughs> excuse me, and, uh, at Pathmos, and they found this magician, a false prophet, whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul and the, a man of intelligence. And this man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But this magician was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away. But Saul, and this is Acts 13, I'm in verse 4, 4 through 12 here. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the anointing, fixed his gaze and said, you are full of deceit and fraud. See, he was coming against what God was trying to do to this proconsul. In other words, to make him believe. You are enemy of all righteousness. You will, you will not cease to make crooked the ways of the Lord. Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell on him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened. So coming against the anointed, Paul said, you will not see for a time. Listen, don't come against God's anointed. Honor and respect them and God will honor you. My time's gone. I'm sorry. God bless you. Have a great week and I'll see you next time.